So um, my topic is about semiconductors. And before I go any further, I wanted to first talk about the, how the uh, electrons are arranged in an atom. So electrons are arranged in the different shells around the nucleus. And then for this quantum model of atoms, each energy level, or you can basically call them shells, they look like an X, X shape. Those shells are consist of four orbitals, which are um, that that is made by P, S, P, D, and F, and then for for a specific atom, we can kind of like do an example here. For example, silicon. The atomic number for a silicon is fourteen, which means there are fourteen electrons in the atom. And then this model can kind of characterize the uh, silicon atom as one S, and then there's a two in there, which means there's there's two electrons in the shell one, which is the one suggests. And then it's in the orbital S. And then in the second shell, there are 2 plus 6, which is 8 electrons in the shell 2. And there are two, 2 of them in the S orbit and 6 in the P orbit. And same for the, for the third shell, there's 2 in the S, S orbital and then 2 in the P orbital. <coughs> and then there's another concept called energy bands and energy gap. The energy band is basically is just a, a pile of closely spaced energy levels and then the energy gap is kind of like the, uh, the big empty space where no energy band is allowed during that in that specific area and this concept is basically characterized different materials kind of like the, uh, whether they are conductors, semiconductors or insulators and then for the insulators there's the empty conduction band which means there's no electrons in it that, it, that is why they, they don't conduct electricity and then for a con for a conductors, there's a completely filled conduction band. That's how. That's why they can con conduct. And then in between the insulator and the conductors, there's this funny semiconductors, which you can see. That basically, they are pretty much the same like the insulator, except that the energy, the, en the band, the band gap is kind of relatively smaller than the insulator. Which means in this case, why make it so special is that kind of some electrons can actually jump from the valence band to the conductor to the, to the conduction band. <coughs> so there are many semiconductor materials. Some of them are called elemental semiconductors because they are made of just single atoms, such as the silicon and germanium. And there are also like compound semiconductors. For example, the gallium nitride is most usually for the light emitting diode, aka LEDs. And then zinc sulfide, which is basically used for our screen, uh, computer screen or television screens. And then let's look at a specific semiconductor material, which is the most common one, silicon. So as as we mentioned earlier, there's 14 electrons in the in the silicon atom, and there's four of them in the valence shell, which is the outermost shell. And then since those electrons will attract the nearby, so oh no. No so, <laughs> so in order for uh, an atom to be stable, the valence shell has to be eight electrons. So that since the silicon has four electrons in our valence shell, they will share another four electrons with neighboring silicon atom and then form this crystal structures. And then this is kind of like the uh, basic uh, building block for semiconductors. And then there's two kinds of semiconductors, one is intrinsic semiconductor, which is just made of pure silicon crystals. But in this case, as I mentioned, so those silic those electrons, those valence electrons are bound with nearby silicon atoms, which means there's no free electron. So the so the number of electrons in the valence shell is exactly eight, which means there's no free electrons around, which means there's no way for the, for electricity to flow because they're all bound together. So that is why we need extrinsic semiconductors. And they are made by in introduce impurity atoms into these crystal structures. And then depending on different types of impurities, they can be characterized into N-type semiconductors and P-type semiconductors. And then, oh, another thing to mention. And then for the extrinsic semiconductors, they have good conductivities. So that's why I make them good. And then, for n-type semiconductors, the doping is usually <coughs> consists of five electrons. So this atom of 
usually have five electrons in your valence shell, and um, the most common one is fluorophorus. And then in doing so, we kind of introduce these atoms into the silicon atom, kind of just replace one silicon atom by another fluorophorus atoms. In this case, since they have five electrons in the valence shell and four electrons in the silicon atoms valence shell, they kind of like share another four uh, electrons with the neighboring uh, silicon shell, but there's one more electron that can just be hanging out, free to move. That that configuration is kind of like the common conductor, which means there's only they, they have because the common conductor like the iron or stuff, they have a one uh, a free electrons that can free to move. That's why they can conduct electricity. And this is the n-type semiconductor, uh, semiconductors, and that's also p-type semiconductor. Unlike the n-type semiconductor that has a free ele uh, electron to, f to move, in this way the dopant is usually consists of three electrons. But since the silicon have four electrons, they can only bind with three. They can so if they share uh, the neighboring electrons with the silicon, there's like a empty space where there's no well. It cannot bond with anything because it has three electrons, but the silicon has four electrons. And in that case, you consider that as a as a little hole. And since we are missing one electron, identically it's kind of like it's positive, right? Because the electron is negative charge. So in this case, the whole thing can be characterized naively, thinking as a positive charge. And that's another way to think about how it can conduct electricity. So in this case, we can. Basically, think the p-type semiconductor as positive as a positive charge, and the n-type semiconductor as negative charge. <coughs> and then those semiconductors can those type of semiconductors, then we can put them together to make something useful. And one thing is the diodes, and the diodes are basically just putting the p-type and n-type conductors together to make this p-n junction. And this is things exact uh, exactly forward bias, which means it can only current flow from one direction to another, not the other way around. Because as we said before, the n-type uh, semiconductor can be considered as a positive, positive charge, and n-type is negative charge. And in this case, if we just put them together without putting any voltage across them, the, uh, the holes in the p-type semiconductors will kind of like attract the neighboring negative, uh, negative charge electrons in the n-type connector. So those electrons will kind of flow from the p-type semiconductor to the uh, from from n-type to the p-type semiconductors, and then eventually all the electrons in the uh, n-type semiconductors will f will fill the holes in the uh, p-type semiconductors. In that case, just kind of like all electrons filled in this hole, meaning no electrons free to move. So in that case, it doesn't connect electricity at all. That is why we need uh, to add to to apply voltage across them. And they it only has to it can, it can only apply the uh, the high voltage uh, on the p side and the lower voltage on n side, so that they can keep flowing and flowing, and the currents can free to flow across this circuit. <coughs> and then the uh, specific current that can flow in this dial is given by that ugly looking equation. When those electrons fill with this holes, evolve the kind of like the jump between the uh, valence band to the, conduct to the conduction band. So we know that if you jump from one energy level to another energy level, you will release energy. And then that energy is kind of like released in terms of photons. That is why we can use dial to con construct those LEDs. And different colors of LEDs are, de are determined by different p-type and n-type semiconductors. In in the kind, for example, the blue LED is used of uh, gallium nitride semiconductors. So those kind, the colors. So basically, the different color of the light is depend on the wavelengths or the frequency, and then the frequency is depend depend on how much energy you released. So that's kind of like, the, and the energy release is depend on the material of this specific semiconductors. So we can modify these, those like the uh, n-type and p-type semiconductor to emit lights that we want. 
And there is another application of those semiconductor idea connectors. It's like the bipolar transistor. And that's kind of like make a hamburger with two bread and then the ham in the middle. And there's two ways to make it. One way is called PNP transistor, which means there's two n-type uh, semiconductors material and then one P in there. And there's also PNP semiconductor, which is two P's and then one N in the middle. And in these two cases, actually the NP and semiconductors are more useful because experiments turns out that the uh, mobility of the electrons is more is better than the uh, mobility of the holes, which means the more electrons we have, the more current we can generate, or the more smooth current we'll have. So we, that is why we we'll, we see more NP and trans transistors often than the uh, PMP transistors. And then in order for those transistors to work functionally, because they are all made up from putting P and N uh, semiconductors, and then in the last example it says the uh, PN has, has the uh, forward bias and the reverse bias current. And in this case, for this specific transistor, the NPN, the uh, <coughs> Earlier, we can see uh, they have a they have a base which is in the middle of here, and then emitter and a collector. So that's that's the base, and then <coughs> so here since it's uh, so it's N P N. So this is P, this is N. So this one it has to be a uh, forward biased here, so that cr so that this transistor can function properly, and uh, this. This bipolar transistor can be used as a uh, electronic switch. An electronic switch can be either in the cutoff state or saturation state. And the cutoff state means the uh, the switch is open, and then the other way is the uh, closed switch. In this case, when in the cutoff station, the B junction or the base emitter junction is reverse biased, which means the voltage here is less than there, which means there's no current can flow because there's a the reason is why because here is connect to the zero voltage, and that's basically for the base voltage, and there's also a voltage drop across here, which means the voltage here is less than here, so that's make it uh, reverse biased, which means no current can flow. That basically means the switch is open, and then. In a saturation state, this one is forward biased, which means there is this voltage is higher than that. And in this case, the current of free to flow, and that and that transistor is considered as uh, is a closed switch that can allow currents to flow. Okay. So there are many more transistors, uh, different transistors. The the one I just introduced is just bipolar. And then there's some more, but those are just kind of like putting different kinds of bipolar transistors together. So they're kind of like a stir fry of bipolar transistors. So um, yeah, okay. So I'm not open to questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, what is is there like a specific cutoff point for what makes something a semiconductor versus an insulator? Because you mentioned the band gap. That yeah. Gap is, is there like a specific point at which a semiconductor becomes an insulator and vice versa? It's kind of depends on like the uh, voltage you apply across those materials. Right. If you just apply very low voltage, that essentially is a insulator. But if you apply a large, large enough voltage, you will have enough energy to jump from the uh, valence band to the conduction band because the gap is is kind of like smaller than a typical insulator. For insulator, it can never jump from the valence band to the conduction band because the energy it requires is too large. It's not physical to for the electrons to jump from the valence band to the conduction band. For, but for a semiconductor, it is possible. We have to apply uh, sufficient energy on it or voltage on it. Yeah. Okay. Then. Any questions? All right, and thank you very much.